everybody. I just wanted to let you know that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audiobook download, a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash design recharge. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, your Android, your Kindle, or your MP3 player. All right, on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Design Recharge. This is episode 317, and I'm excited to have my friend, Catherine Ehrensberg. And Catherine is a designer, but she's also a landscape architect and landscape designer. I never really know, is there a difference between those two things? There is certainly a difference between those two things. I'm actually not a landscape architect. I am a landscape designer. Um, I graduated with a degree in landscape architecture, but that is not enough to make you a landscape architect. So um, basically you have to get the registration just like you would if you were to become a professional engineer or a professional architect. So there's like a certification program that goes along with it. So I didn't, I didn't go and get it. So, so if you, like with interior design, they also have a certification. So you're an interior decorator or you're an Correct. interior designer. Is it sort no, of like that? It's really interesting. Yeah. So a landscape architect is on the same accreditation level as an interior designer, but an interior decorator is on the same level as a landscape designer. It's confusing. Really? The, the nomenclature, yeah, it's a little confusing. So designer is not designer. You know, there's a landscape architect is equal to interior designer, but the word designer is not really what Does means it. anything. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, but it, so uh, I guess I just think of what you do is um, a little bit, um, I don't know. I think that it, it just, it takes a lot because you're actually doing some in, uh, Furniture, right? I thought landscape design was just plants. Plants. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, it really runs a very large gamut of things. There's a lot of kids that, I say kids, we're 36 years old now or older, but um, a lot of the students that came out of my class are doing city planning and parks and uh, universities and big campus designs and things like that, military bases, some really big type stuff. So my take in doing something super small like furniture, you know, styling of a patio is like micro, you know, there's just such a big span of things that you can do. So, um, I like that. I like the, the patterns and the colors and the textures and all that stuff. That's so small, you know, it just different strokes for different folks. So one of the things that I, I love about you is that you have, so you have the knowledge of the plants. You also have the knowledge of the regions because we're in zones, right? And so, but right. really design is design. You're trying to not overwhelm. Uh, you're trying to create a space, a feeling, mm-hmm. um, something. So you also work with clients. You work with, um, you work with more residential. Do yes. you do commercial as well? Do you try to split it? How do you? Um, I do, as of right now, I'm not doing any commercial and it's, it's not my favorite thing to do as far as every, every city has a landscape ordinance and that's the minimum number of trees that you have to have on a job site. And most people, when they're doing a commercial project, they're just doing the minimum because you have to get a certificate of occupancy. And so to me, the work isn't quite as interesting or, you know, inspiring and <laughs> all that than uh, the residential, the residential job is every person lives their life differently. Every person has a different number of dogs or, you know, kids or grandkids or they have a small little 50 by 100 lot or they have a big five acre lot and so everything is so different on every project that it keeps me doing something different and without that I think I might go a little more crazy than I already am you know what I mean it's just I need things to be a little bit different all the time because it's more interesting so it's sort of like right therapy for your outside spaces yeah I mean it's it's get it you know i think a lot of us have jobs where things can get pretty mundane if you're doing the same thing day in and day out so it's the one tweak in the the thing that you are doing design day in and day out that makes things different enough to where you feel like they're fresh every day and not you know getting old so so one of the things so there's a lot of um similarities between how you work with your clients and how we work with ours. Mm -hmm. It's also how we market, right? So one of the things that you have to deal with is a lot of times people aren't changing houses all the time. It's Mm -hmm. not like, Hey, you know what, this week I'm going to change houses, but it's kind of like people who are starting businesses. They, if they're doing uh, brands or they have to get new brands all the time. Now, some people have multiple businesses and they could do brands for those, you, you could be the designer for that. And sometimes a company will need design work throughout, right? Right. But, but what you're doing is you have to get a lot of new 
clients on a regular basis. So mm-hmm. uh, it's not like a dentist, you know, they, people keep their teeth, hopefully. Um, <laughs> right. The, re- the reoccurring. Yeah. Right. So there's, there's this, um, you have to get out there and, and in front of people on a different way in a different, um, because your end goal is new. You, it's a new kind of, you may have some recurring, right? Cause people need something mm-hmm. fixed or adjusted or do you know what I mean? Or there's, you know, they'll start off on one phase of the project and then they're ready for the next phase or just their front yard. Now let's do the backyard later or, Oh, now we're going to add a pool, you know, that kind of thing. So every once in a while I've had, I've had a handful of repeat clients, um, but again, that's, those are pretty few and far between for a residential landscape design job. Yeah. All right. So some of that is what we're going to talk about today. So you have not just, I mean, you really go all, all out. And if, uh, <laughs> when the first time I watched the show, so she produce, produces a show. This is, she's done six seasons, right? Correct. Mm-hmm. That's right. All right. So six Don't seasons. Don't watch season one and season, well, you can go back and watch them if you want, but you know, they're rough. I did. I watched it. I like, I like them. I, I like it. I, I think, um, I, Hey, somebody's here. Diane's number one fan. Who is that? Oh, Fred. He's in. Hi Belgium. Fred. Oh, oh. But, oh, we're international. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I'm glad. Thanks. I'm glad you're here. So one of the things that you do is that you really believe in video content. So you, yes. as a landscape designer, you have some restrictions on, you also have four kids. Can you believe yeah. that people are just four kids? <laughs> so you have a restriction on where you can go. You can't go to Texas on Tuesday and then go to Boston. So there's some things, there's zones, there's the way plants grow. There's different kinds of uh, plants that go in these places. There's also just sure. different, a whole bunch of different things that um, we might think, oh, well, we don't have those, but we do have those restrictions as well. This client can only have two color jobs or they have to have this metallic and everything they do or something, you know? So yeah. it, there's specific things, but we can actually work further away than mm-hmm. what maybe you, you can. And there's also sometimes restrictions on even um, if you can design and not be a landscape architect. Mm. So a lot of places, even for in States, um, you can't design for a residential client unless you're registered as a landscape architect in that state. Louisiana is one of those states. So I have to be, I have to know what the rules are on those states too. But yeah, not as, not even plants and knowing what plant material there are, but just rules of the, the professional societies that they have there. Anyway, well, I know that wasn't the question you were asking. No, that, but. <laughs> but that's good to know. But one of the things is, and this is a, so you are limited to, you know, we think about like a dentist would also, we'll just keep pulling up the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> they aren't like getting people from Louisiana to come to Mobile to go right. get their teeth fixed, right? right. You you're have a, a limited audience mm-hmm. of where you can go. And you actually could go, you know, all, maybe some places in Mississippi, Ocean sure. Springs, maybe to some maybe places in Florida because we mm-hmm. live on the Gulf Coast. Um, so there's a, a range, but there's a mileage that you're willing to drive to go and, and work with a client, right? Sure. you physically have to go there. Right. So, um, this is one of the challenges that maybe we don't have to do, but you have blown out of the water. So you've taken this and you know how to edit video. You know how to produce video. You are really big on Instagram. You do a lot of things with stories, but one Mm -hmm. of the things that is one of, uh, the philosophy that we're going to get into is talking about engagement and how much engagement is more important then maybe quantity, right? Yeah. So I truly believe that. Yeah. Can you just talk? So how did you start? So you're putting plants in people's yards, right? I'm, I'm just totally, <laughs> right. Not really. Right. Not digging any holes. I don't dig any holes. Um, I saw you carrying this one thing. This lady's like, this isn't that heavy. And you're like, lady, because <laughs> I'm carrying it at all. <laughs> that was always special for the show um, that I would do some of the work just for the show so that we could you know, get it all done and not have to hire contractors for the show. There's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes, as you can imagine, for quote unquote TV um, that you have to do that you may not actually do in the professional, you know, world. But anyway. So, but how did you decide, um, what was the inkling? What made you think, hey, you know what? I want to do this. I want to try to do this. Did you watch Joanna Gaines or... No, I actually did not know who Joanna Gaines was. Um, I think I started back in 2014 or 2015, maybe in 15. Um, 
a woman from Canada hired me to come on her job site and help her with uh, a landscape. She was renovating a house in Oak, the Oakley District, which is the historic district here in Mobile. She was renovating a house. She needed a consult on a tree. She, she's from Canada. She comes down here. She's loving all of the oak trees and all. Anyway, she loves all the things. She's trying to renovate this old house because it's uh, Victorian and old and just so like antebellum mobile, you know? And so she called me in to do a tree consult and it just so happened that she was doing a web series about the whole process of renovating this house. Um, and brings me in and I had heard that there was going to be cameras there. So like I had just had a baby. Cecilia was probably four or five months old. So I like stuck on my skinny jeans, like pulled up and sucked in and like put on my cutest outfit I could figure out, put on makeup and was like, I'm going to get on camera. I don't know what on earth. I don't know that it's one of those dreams that I'm not sure I ever was able to articulate to myself about this is what I want to do. I would love to do this, whatever that means. And so, um, I got together with her, ended up getting on camera was a big part of her web series. And then she kind of coached me into, well, if you like doing this and you like being on camera, how are you, what are you going to do with that? Um, you have to have practice, like you have to start practicing being on camera. And so a lot of it was just practicing so that I didn't look like a fool. Cause again, if you go back to season one, that's me, I call them seasons, but that's me practicing to become what everybody says, you're a natural on camera. No, I'm not. <laughs> Go back to season one. Trust me, you'll see I'm not natural on camera. It was kind of a learned behavior over time. Um, you just get used to it. So um, it was a multifaceted thing for me. It was, I can gain my own camera experience. It can be a marketing tool for my company. Maybe some bigger company will see what I'm doing and they'll hire me to do videos for them. Um, it was also, you know, Catherine, you're an exterior designer, but you cost, you, you charge a, what for a lot of people is a very big chunk of money. And for a, for a lot of my clients at the time would have eaten a big chunk out of their budget just to hire me. And so I felt like the videos were a way for me to put out free advice to multiple people rather than having, you know, me going over and giving you my time one-on-one. -on -one. If I can hand it out to several hundred people at a time, then that would be helpful without really costing me any more than just setting up my tripod and posting to YouTube. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of things going on there. And I think um, it's definitely worked that way. Um, with the, the marketing standpoint, you know, if, if I am reaching the person that can't afford to hire me because their budget just can't afford a designer, then maybe their friend can. And so a lot of the word of mouth um, sharing of videos that way didn't just reach the, the people who needed my free advice so that they could do their own. It reached their friends who could hire me. So. Well, it's also, you know, I, I think that's really important, but it also, one of the things I learned is that, hey, you could do this. This wasn't, doesn't have to be this huge job. Right. You know, you could help just with a, a portion or you could just help me make my porch look better or, yeah. or staging for a house to get it to sell. I know that there was one right. pretty early on you did. And it's like, you know, or you redid this lady, you went to school with her kids and you read it like the fountain area out. So it was like these smaller projects that mm -hmm. we could hire. We might, you know, it's not like you're gutting out all the right. sod and, you know, like, I feel like we think, oh, you're hiring an exterior designer, landscape designer. It's going to be, you know, uh, $50,000. You know, sometimes I think, right. are, and that's some of the tips that you share are some of the things that we could do on our own, but also it makes it, oh, maybe it's not as, as big maybe as I think, but it's also a way of having those small things of little things that I could do to make my house more attractive or the plants that I buy that I could help make better. Right. right. Yeah. And that's, we actually got away from that a little bit. And now I'm actually reining it back in to get back there because when we first started, it was even with the production as good as it was, we were doing small projects and then somehow it kind of blew up and it became, you know, pool houses and you know how, you know, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then suddenly I sat at home and I thought, this is crazy. We can't, we can't keep producing these huge, cause I don't think it's relatable to the people at home anymore why don't we reel it back and become what we were? So it's just taking that, I mean, from a business perspective, it's that ability to stop in the middle of what you've been doing and like the train that you've been, <laughs> you know, building that track for all that time and then reel it back and go, no, simpler, simple is better, you know? And I think that's what people want is so that's what we're getting back to now. And so that's like for us, if we're creating content as a designer, 
if you're just doing this huge thing for the, I saw Michael Vonville just comes in. He's in Houston. So it's like, he's doing something for the Houston Astros. I mean, none of, most of us are never going to work for the Houston Astros. You know, that would be such a big, a really big client, but having small mom and pop shops that we maybe do something like this with, then more people, it actually could reach more people that we, they could actually hire us. Right. Sure. Yeah, so, absolutely. So what other kinds of things did you, were you doing before you started the web series? And it's a, it's a, I mean, like you guys should watch this. Like I put a YouTube channel, it's simple, honest design. You can actually watch it on Amazon prime also, or you can watch it on YouTube and they're not, so it's not like she's doing 30 minutes of TV, right? It's, uh, they're smaller chunks, but no commercials. It's terrific. Right. <laughs> So, I wish we could have commercials. I, well, Sometimes one day you will. Sponsorships would be nice. <laughs> right. So, but one of the things that's great is that, I mean, you went all out. Like I, right. I am a little, uh, I'm like, oh, hers is so polished and mine's like the opposite of polished. Like, yeah, yeah, but you have more money in your pocket at the end of the day because I've spent a lot of money on that web series. And really a lot of it was one season, I think it was season three, I said, you know what, we're going to go all out on this thing. We're going to make it look as good as it can so that that companies see what our potential is. They can see what our production quality can be if they were to hire us to create a web series for them or to represent their brand. And so I had these big goals for what, you know, this could be. Um, but after three seasons of doing that high quality, I feel like we've proven ourselves and what we can do. Um, and it's gotten to, like, I can't handle it on my own anymore. And so we're starting to take on sponsorships and things like that. So um, it just, you know, again, you just kind of have to revise things and, you know. What is marketing? They, you have to change yeah. all the time. It's constant. It's not like you can do the same thing today that you're going to do 20 years from now. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. Or even two years from now, the way. But just knowing that you started, this was a big undertaking. Mm-hmm. Um, so... When you, uh, all right, so why do you believe so big in video? So, because you don't just do the web series. You have uh, Instagram stories are really big. You have a big following in, in though you have a very engaged, yes. uh, very, <laughs> very engaged following and a, and a healthy number of followers. Yeah. You know, you're also thinking about your distance, right? You may be focusing more. And these are things you and I've talked about, like mm-hmm. you could expand out because there are certain assets I know that you have to make in your job that might help somebody else who's a landscape architect or, or a landscape designer who's starting their own business. Right. Um, but even the stuff with the video, the video, you're, you're, it's just so high quality. Why, why do you have to be high quality? Well, I don't, I really don't think high quality was the key. That was because I felt like we were pitching to possibly production companies and I just wanted it to be good. We're reeling back on that now. Although the content producer I have just produces great quality. It's not ever going to look like it's on its cell phone, but I'm still very happy doing the Instagram story quality, which is me with my cell phone, like this close to my face before I put makeup on in the morning, my hair's correct. Like, no, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me, the quality of that. Um, I just think there's different platforms and different, you know, different mediums and ways to deliver. Um, but why do we need more than one? I, I think this is really important. Why do we need to be delivering content in different, on different platforms in different ways? And why should well, we be? Well, let me say this. Well, the, the answer to that question is that every platform is different. I mean, the people, the age of the people and the gender of the people that I have on Facebook are so different than the ones that I have on Instagram. And those are different from the ones that I have on YouTube. And so um, you just have to understand each platform. And I'm not saying I understand them perfectly well, but I know the age of the people on Facebook. and I know the age of the people on Instagram and how people work on YouTube. They're Google, you know, they're basically YouTube searching things. And so the way that I lay out, um, the search bar or whatever. I just kind of catered all those people. Um, but ultimately the purpose and all of those different, uh, content production, uh, launching all that stuff is that I am, I, I think of trying to hire an artist to paint a piece of art for you. Um, if you see their art, that's great. But if you know that you're going to have to have someone creating a custom piece of um, art for you, you would like to know that you can trust them, that when you hand them your mm-hmm. money, that they're going to do what you 
would trust them to do with it. They're trustworthy, they're authentic, they're not gonna be difficult to work with, they're not gonna get halfway through the project and then our personalities clash and so we can't work together. And so to me, another facet of that content production was um, getting, pe people can see me, they can hear me, they can, they know that we would jive before we even talk. So, you know, I think it's every designer's dream to have potential clients who don't do what they do, which is called um, kick the tire. So they want you to come over, they want you to look, they want you to basically spend time before you've ever um, actually made that contract with them. And these videos and this content have allowed me to grow the uh, trust with an audience where they never ask me, they say, we want you, we can't afford you yet, but I'll be calling you in six months. And then when they can afford me, they call me. Um, or they tell their friends and their friends call me. So that's a dream. I mean, we all dream of clients who just call you and say, I want you, period, end of story. We've seen what you've done, we've heard you, we know we can work with you in that scene of the story. So that's that's a big reason for it. So I, I love that. So that maybe this is something we should be incorporating so that we are, um, putting our personalities because a lot of what we do with a brand with a with a company is it can you work and if you're showing what you can do you're able to kind of they're able to see if it will be a good fit and there's mm -hmm. none of that like mm, I, mm, I can't work with her or right right so yeah, yeah you're kind of like cutting that out so some of that wasted time which is wasted money mm -hmm. is is now out the door and you don't have to to do it and it sometimes is a little bit hard to do if it's just flat graphics if you're just showing your portfolio there's sure. something missing because there what we do has to do with us being able to sometimes interpret what somebody else wants and their ideas that they can't articulate right so yeah so to me that's that's how content could really come to benefit somebody like you that that you can show the story of how you create a graphic and say, here's what they told me they're, mm. you know, you don't even have to show them on the video at all or in, in, in or in any of the content, but showing, um, you know, the list of what they wanted or how you start off and how many sketches you do to get to that point and then how many revisions and why you made the change. I just, the best example for me of a long-term story has been Festival of Flowers, which is a um, regional flower show here in Mobile. I was the designer last year at the show, and I decided that I was going to make that a piece of ongoing content, a story that I was going to tell to benefit the show. It was a nine-month process um, from start to finish. I showed us in design meetings. I showed us going out and looking at that big blank field that turns into the flower show. I showed the guy building the canal, um, the fountain guy building this big canal, and people were just bought in on on being a part of the story. I mean, our sales went up at the door 20% just by, and I, I mean, maybe the weather was really good that year, <laughs> but I would choose to believe that 20% is just, a really large percentage to go yeah, up, but because, in one year. because you had made them part of that story, because you understood the power of video as well as you understood the power of the story and making people feel, and that's where engagement comes in, right? Right, right. And we were telling the people of uh, uh, the stories about who was involved and how many people are involved and how long it takes. I think it's so easy, especially in an event like that, to walk in and be like, yeah, flowers, end of story. But I had shown them over nine months that there were a thousand people involved in this. People traveled from hundreds of miles away to be vendors. Um, you know, the lifts and the cranes and all like the days and weeks and months that it takes to prep for this thing, people felt like they were a part of the story. And so I think that people need to feel like they're a part of your story, you know? It's just important to me, for sure. But it's right, so Raxa asked this question. So he said he's kind of late, but we don't mind. Raxa's Hi, like, Raxa. in DC. <laughs> so, um, how did you build trust with clients? So let's just say, how do you build trust? In general, we hopefully know how to build trust with clients that we're working face to face with. But how, how so I know that you've had people, you've had people call you, you didn't know that they'd watched you, you didn't know that they knew about you, and then they tell you later, right? Right. Um, so can you kind of go through one of that? Because that's where that trust is built, because you don't know if they know if they've watched a series, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think trust is built when you, you speak the truth. You only talk about the stuff you know about. <laughs> mm. If you don't know about it, don't talk about it. And if you don't know about it and you know your audience wants to, 
wants to know about it, go learn about it before you start talking about it. Um, Cause someone out there is going to know whether or not you're telling the truth. Now there's always opinions in design. Of course. I mean, design is so um, subjective anyway that people could disagree, but I, I mean, I work with concrete. I work with uh, some pretty specific items that could be, it's a yes or no. There's no design, uh, argument there. And so I think you, you have to speak the truth for long enough and uh, often enough to where people know that that you're not going to give them the runaround. You're not going to, you know, take a sponsorship and tell them that a product is good when it really sucks. Mm. You know, I mean, I've, I can't tell you how often a company will contact me and want to send me a planter or a string of lights or whatever. And I've already used it. And I didn't like it. I'm not going to accept it and, and, put it out to my audience just to get 50 or a hundred bucks or a free string of lights. And so I think you build the trust by just speaking the truth. And so what, much right. so what about with, cause this is a big thing because this is one of the reasons that you do this is so that you can kind of cut out. Uh, if you're just thinking about it as a business, this could be multiple things. This has op opportunities for multiple growth, right? Um, but as you as a landscape designer and as us as graphic designers or web designers, having teaching somebody about how I work, my process helps cut out the mystery where there sometimes can be a lot of mystery. They think we wear all black and right. we all the boys have black eyeliner, you know, they just don't, you know, they're we're real I wonder where that perception even comes from. Isn't that funny? I, I don't know, but I even like in when you know, when I'm like meeting with a client and if I was bringing an intern with me, I'd be like, Hey, don't wear black. You know, like I yeah. literally have said that because, because they, I think sometimes the clients are scared enough of about us, you know, like it's a I big think, investment. That's how I, I always am very, um, aware of how big of an investment a designer is for a homeowner or for a business, especially a small business. I think that you have to be really not sympathetic, that's probably not the word, but really aware of what these people are having to sacrifice mm. in order to, to use your service. I mean, it's, I know I'm a small business owner, <laughs> you know, so I know it's a sacrifice. I know it's an investment in themselves. And so I don't want to mess that up for one, but I also want to make them as comfortable with the process as they can possibly be. Like you All right, said. So, so one of the things that I think is not just about speaking the truth, speaking the stuff that you know about. I think there's also something that you bring and you definitely get it in all your videos. I love, even with the lady who's like, this isn't that heavy. Like you came out. It was the <laughs> real Catherine that I know. She's holding this. Catherine's like lifting back and it's a big plant in this big plant. I mean, it was a big, it's a it's tree. Like eight feet tall. Uh -huh. Yeah. And the lady's lifting on the other side and she's like, this isn't that heavy. And Catherine's like, cause I'm doing all the lifting. <laughs> And it was funny is the way it's the uh, season six starter, I think, or season yeah. five starter. And, but that's one of the things I think that a lot of people have is one, maybe they're too afraid to get on camera and practice because you're going to mess up. Right. And then the other is how do you, how do you get your authentic self? Because you don't want to, you know, how do you adjust so that you're not, um, or, or is that, I mean, I think what we see on there is really you and, but in the very beginning, you might not have been as open to that. What kind of, uh, benefits have you seen when you've kind of let down the walls and been more open? Um, I definitely think that I get a lot more feedback. People relate to it more. People can tell when you're being real. And I mean, I think the baloney, baloney malarkey factor is pretty, uh, thick if you don't be your authentic self, you know? And so I definitely get more feedback. And, um, again, the trust builds off of that for sure. And I didn't start off that way. Season one, I sat in, in front of a tripod with my camcorder and I like had a script, which I can't memorize a line to save my life. I have to be, I realize about myself, I've got to be off the cuff. Um, but you know, when it comes to the, what you're talking about, lifting up that holly tree and all that, that's just, it's who I am. Thank goodness. There's a, there's a, somebody there behind me catching it on camera. I think it's a lot easier to edit yourself when you're holding the camera in front of you mm. than it is when there's someone just catching it. Cause if they catch it, then they can edit it however they want, which is a good thing and a bad thing. 
But it, when you're self-editing because you're holding your own camera and you're just talking directly to the camera, that's a lot harder to let go of. And it just takes practice. And it's better to go ahead and start posting everything in the beginning when nobody's watching than it is to, I mean, nobody's watching you. I, who cares? All right. So one of I the mean, things that I love, and this is kind of a tip, right? So at, to get more comfortable in front of the camera, you say do Instagram stories. Just start, start there because it goes away in 24 hours, right? Right. It's gone. Yeah. If, if you make a mistake, which I don't think there really are any mistakes, but you know, 24 hours later, if nobody cares about the bologna sandwich you ate for dinner or whatever, then it goes away. I mean, I've done plenty of stories. I probably did one and two days ago where I watched it and I was like, this is so boring, but sometimes it's not boring. Someone else doesn't think it's boring. And so, um, I hate to drag Gary V into this, but he's big into document. Don't create. So if you're mm -hmm. just documenting what you're doing on a daily basis and don't try to, to really edit it too much and try to really think too much about what you're trying to do with it. Like there's, it's too much thought. You know what I mean? Like don't put too much thought in it, especially not at the beginning, just so you can get comfortable on camera. All right, so you would also say, hey, so Hannah's saying that's helpful advice. You would say, Hannah, just get on camera and post it. So, yeah. Oh, and post it with, um, try to recap a little bit on your typing. <laughs> Sorry, okay. that's a random note. But Hannah, if you're going to get on camera, which is great, uh, try to recap in text below what you're saying because people watch it with mute on. They don't, mm. they don't watch it with the voice on. So a lot of people will skip past if you're just speaking and you don't have any type underneath, they'll just skip past your stories and not listen because they're like sitting on a toilet. And not, you mean like yeah. closed caption? Yes. Okay. But you have, in Instagram, you have to do it yourself though. Yes. That's a problem for me. Um, <laughs> the guys better just unmute people. <laughs> They're, they'll get there eventually. Okay, so so that would be one thing. There was a couple other things you have as some. We're jumping around a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, Diane. No, no, I'm I'm jumping around. I'm controlling the question. <laughs> what do you mean? Don't be apologizing. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So one of the things. So I want to. There are some things that you are are pet peeves for you, and yeah. that really bother you. And I actually I did this the other day because I know I will watch my can't I. It's hard to just look at the camera. I know Chris does this all the time. Chris Doe, he literally is always, he's always watching the camera. I know he can't even see me because it's a monitor's not underneath. Yeah, so I'm watching, like, I'm looking at you right now. Right. But he'll, I, he, like, he would have to turn his head to look at me, I think, sometimes. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it's funny, but that is one of your pet peeves on the phone. Now, I think with my little phone, it, you can't see me. Tell us the pet peeve so I don't. All know. right. <laughs> so you guys have, I'm looking at you in the camera right now. You guys have watched uh, Instagram stories before. And okay, right now I'm, I'm sitting close and I'm looking at you, right? So when I talk to you in the camera, I am speaking to you and you can see I'm speaking to you. Now, if I have my phone in my hand and you open up Instagram stories and I'm doing this <laughs> the whole time. You look like you're looking down my shirt. Catherine. Okay, fine. Let's say I'm looking right here. <laughs> Okay. I'm looking right here. I'm looking at myself in the camera as I speak and everybody knows it. I want you to engage with me. When you speak to me on Instagram stories, I want you to speak to me. You see that close? Do we need to get that close? Girl, have you seen my Instagram? I'm looking at you now. Instagram stories, I'm like 6 a.m. morning face Catherine. Uh, <laughs> it's just that tiny little dot. I know. And that's, that is actually the, probably the biggest thing for people is staring at this, what they call the unblinking eye. It's just there's, there's nothing, it's weird to speak to just a dot on your phone, but mm -hmm. and you'd rather speak to yourself, which I'm doing right now. But it's when the person's watching you on the other end, it's way better if you're talking to them. Did you know that for the listeners of the Design Recharge podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a 30 day free trial, and it gives you the opportunity to check out their services. I am currently reading Hurting Tigers by Todd Henry. He's been on the podcast before. And I love him. He definitely writes for creatives. And you can download one of these books uh, that I've shared in the past, or maybe a book that you've been dying to read. I love because a lot of the times they're read by the author. And I just think that's really nice to hear their voice and their inflection of what they were really, how they were trying to get it across. Oh, I just hit my elbow. Oh, it was really that hard. It was just the wait anyway okay okay so doc has a question and i think this is a good tip as well it wasn't on the sheet good job doc 
Um, so what about live? When you're doing Instagram live, do you tend to not do live? You tend to record and then post? Or is there, because then you're posting the text. How do you, what content would you say would be okay to be live? And then what content would, be, would you produce as a recording and then post it? That's Still onto stories. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't do live very often. Um, there's, Why? I don't know. I don't know if it's because I feel like they drag on too long. Like mm. maybe, unless we're talking, like right now we're having an interview and so we're talking about something really specific. But generally I'm on a job site or I'm talking about, you know, a video I'm doing or whatever. And I just feel like people don't want to sit around and watch for fit. I mean, you know, I'm just like that short attention span. And so I'm trying to give people the succinct version of everything I'm doing in live. And they have to be watching it right then. Of course you can post it later, but I don't have enough followers for me to feel comfortable that people are going to tune in as soon as I'm Maybe if Catherine's I had a bigger live, following, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think if I had a bigger following, I would do more lives. For but do sure. you, do you follow, do you, when someone comes live, do you log in and watch them? Uh, yeah. So I tend to try to do actions that I do myself. So all of my pet peeves come from things that annoy me that other people do. So then I try not to do them. Do you know what I mean? I'm sure mm -hmm. I did them once upon a time. Um, another pet peeve is I don't post one photo of something and that's a story like it needs to be a series of three four five all together one subject preferably video maybe with one photo or piece of um copy you know typed words in between that brings the story together but it is called instagram stories for a reason in my opinion and you should be telling a story that is a succinct story all right, so let's talk about how you come up with some of this content because I think you and I have talked about this and you're like, mm. so tell them, <laughs> tell, so, because this is really, a, you know, Hannah, I love Hannah. I, she may or may not think this or not, but right, she may not struggle with this because I don't know, her and I haven't talked about this, um, but what if Hannah's like, I don't know what, I have this client, I'm, okay, so I'm showing my sketches and I'm showing, I'm doing a screen recording of how me making the logo and I'm speeding it up. What, you know, how did you get good at storytelling for one? And then how, how do you know if this is a good story? Because you said, Sometimes you're like, ah, this seems boring, but I'm just going to post it and see. Yeah, because you want to see what that engagement is. You got to test out the water sometimes. You can't always talk about the same things every day, day in and day out. Um, but a lot of my content, actually, I think I've gotten better at thinking of what to post about by posting about stuff. <laughs> as right. crazy as that sounds, it's by a gauge, right? It is. Yeah, just by practicing. And I'll literally, like yesterday, now this is on Instagram stories, but yesterday, or Monday, uh, my content producer came over, we shot four videos in 30 minutes, literally within my street. We did one on citrus trees that are about, I know that nobody knows that citrus trees come uh, fruiting in November and December. Everybody thinks they're a summer fruit because citrus is like a summer flavor. Um, we did one on concrete versus asphalt driveways. We did one on dying concrete and we did one on um, shutters on houses. So like I literally just look around and go, people probably don't know about that. I, you know, it, it really was practicing for me because for a long time, I just assumed that everything I knew, everybody else knew, but through the interaction and the engagement through the social media, people would ask me the most basic questions about what I was doing. And it clicked like, they don't know a thing because not only did I go to college for it, but I've been doing gardening and outside stuff my whole life. Like I grew up outside. I, I did all outside stuff. People said, you should be a landscape architect. So I was like, all right, I'll be a landscape architect, you know, so I went to school for it. And so, um, I forget that I literally have 30 years of experience of trial and error and all kinds of things that I've done with my hands, um, beyond just schooling, you know, I've got clients, uh, examples that I've done my own, as you know, we do construction on our own house. And so I understand how things are put together. Um, so my own experiences and showing those to people have just, again, earned trust, but then they ask questions and that helps me produce even more content. All right. So this is another question. So this is sometimes where like this design recharge is not for my customer. Design recharges for other designers or other design entrepreneurs or uh, small business owners that are trying to expand. Or um, we talk about marketing. We talk about uh, uh, 
sketching. We talk about all kinds of things, right? Right. So but this is the focus. We're not like, I'm not trying to do anything except educate designers and mm-hmm. design entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. So when I have, I have two, I have actually three, I have a notebook and it has three tabs. I have one is things that are just for students because I think sometimes now it could be these really basic things, right? Mm-hmm. That you're creating or making that are, uh, that maybe somebody who's new to the industry would be interested in maybe a regular person that's a client might, but it's kind of rare for me. Like I'm thinking about, like if you're talking about something specific that maybe a student that's in landscape architecture or landscape design, right. or they're, um, or they're just starting out in their business as a landscape designer, you know, there's right. certain things yes. that you would teach them that a customer, right. a lady with a plant or a house with a pool that she doesn't really care about, right? Yeah. So th- right. that's where content. So I have content for students, content for designers, design mm-hmm. entrepreneurs like y'all, and then I have content for clients. Mm-hmm. And the content for clients lives on another site. It has another channel. And I try not to mix those because they're really different audiences because I tend, and I don't know if you do this ever because you're a mom, right? You are a wife, you run your own business. You also are a landscape architect, landscape designer, sorry. I keep messing up on that. You're fine. We'll just pretend. I'm I kidding. just can't call myself one. You can call me one. Just I can't call okay. myself one. Okay. So, but you have, um, when you're creating content, how do you, how do you focus so that you're getting, because I think sometimes we tend to, um, my friend Brian's not here, but he creates uh, videos on Skillshare. So Skillshare, that's for designers for designers. It's not mm-hmm. for a, a customer, yeah. but then he might create co- uh, content, video content for customers. That's different, right? How, mm-hmm. I don't know how you deal with a designer. So the uh, authenticity that you're talking about, about sharing your process, you just can't go, or maybe you can go so deep, but you just wouldn't want to have 30 minutes of really deep on something because like my mom lover, she's here, but she sometimes is like, yeah, last week was over my head. I was yeah. like, mom, it was kind of over my head too. But you know, cause we were talking about SEO and it's really right. Rough, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is the, I don't do a lot of, I mean, my clients are all residential and that's how I focus my, I'm not residential, but consumer and possible, possible consumers of, of me, of, of my, uh, services my services thank you and so i actually right now don't create any content for other designers um or what was the other one you mentioned students other, or like people who yeah. are learning but but, Kathy, but i want how, to i need to but i how, like to get there and you will i think for sure but how how do you keep that customer um knowledge and customer what they want front um front and center um, hmm. How do you do, imagine I, someone? How do I keep it? I'm not sure I understand like, the question. How, so that you don't ever, like you haven't had this problem, but I would have this problem. I would maybe go too deep into something about how to use this program that a, my client, Cindy, has. she doesn't care. She just wants me to give her her oh. certificate, you know? <laughs> like it's, it's less about, oh, well, we've got to take this off of the plant so that the roots are, you know, they might, they're like, hey, I, you're going to do that for me, right? But it's about why, what maybe some of the upkeep, or you know what I mean? Like it's customer focus is very, for us and for you, is very different than talking to our own people. Well, so on the graphic des- design end of things, you bring a customer from start to finish, from their conception of an idea all the way through to the actual final logo. Um, and I am, I am with you as far as the design is concerned, but then we hand it off to a contractor that actually builds it. And that's usually where the technical stuff comes in as far as, you know, you get out of the ground, there's an irrigation system and you hit that. Now I understand all that stuff and that's, that is part of what I do, but I don't ever communicate that with a homeowner unless there's a problem or unless we have to. So basically I create, I act as a liaison between the homeowner and the contractor that we choose together, um, that fits the budget and you know, all that good stuff. And so then the contractor will come to me and say, look, we couldn't, we can't get in the whatever gravel. Would you be willing to switch it to this? Or can you give, what's the height of that bench? We don't bother the client about that. And you know, any of that stuff, that's all the 
the nitty gritty stuff that basically I shield them from, I guess. <laughs> and so um, there is a detail, you know, past, I guess, where a graphic designer would go as far as it actually being constructed. We have to build this thing. And so um, I guess I don't ever have to really um, get into too many details of why we're doing things. They just say either how much is it going to cost more to do it that way, you know, or is it going to kill the tree if we don't do it that way or whatever. And it, it kind of goes from there. So maybe it's about keeping um, you, but you really have a good idea of what's interesting to your, your customer and you don't go because I think sometimes designers maybe can go too deep. You know, you're watching a video and you're like, mm, I didn't really need to, know, need to know that. And I've made videos like this that are way too long on the, you know, I'm going to tell you how to use the, why we use the Pantone. Just tell me where the, the Pantone thing panel is so I can choose the right color. You know, like right. this could have been a 10 second video and I made it, you know, three minutes or something. So yeah, how do you come up? do you have a list? Do you have something in your phone notes? Do you, as you're walking your kids, walking your kids, like let's, yeah, you don't walk, your push kids. them in their stroller. Yeah. I used to, <laughs> not anymore, they're bigger now. I'm, I'm thinking like leashes. I just, you know, like with a, <laughs> I have a dog, I walk my dog, but hopefully you don't do that. I know some people mm -hmm. do that, but okay. Not me. <laughs> We're not promoting that people. Um, it's those people in the mall, you know, like, I'm like, why does your kid have a leash? But okay. <laughs> But what about how, how do you keep an ongoing list? Is it just that you, like you and Nate are just like, you're like, hey, I got four ideas today. Let's just jump at it. No, so I do keep a running list. And then at the beginning, or on the weekend or at the end of each week, I put together a chunk that we can do all together on Monday. So next Monday, I have a job that's being, it will be finished on Monday. Um, it's a complete landscape job. They have landscape, hardscape, a patio, a walkway, um, a fountain. And so what we do is we go, in this case, we went before and we got, I worked with the contractor. We walked through about what it was going to look like, did that final walkthrough before they start construction. That's one video. Then we'll do what well, he'll go through. Nate will go through and he'll do a final video of the after. That's another video. Then I'll uh, do individual videos of what the fountain looks like, why I chose it, why it looks the way it does. Then we'll do a gravel. Why do we put walk? Why do we put um, edge edging next to the gravel walkway? And then we'll do another one maybe on some specific plant. So we have started to break down every job and every um, larger piece of content into smaller ones that we can video in an hour's time and then it can span a week or two worth of um, you know Facebook and Instagram content. So do you ever worry about having the same thing again or are you okay because this is an investment you have this is your first hire is is Nate and he mm -hmm. is your con uh, your I don't know what do you call him I call him a content producer. Content producer. I was, thought yeah. you were about to say, I call him Nate. But anyway. <laughs> um, you, he's your content producer. So he's helping you come up with ideas. Maybe he's also, his background is in video, right? His, yes. Uh, editing. He's not a plant editing. guy, right? I mean, that's not, he doesn't go to Lowe's on the weekend for fun. Well, no. maybe he does now, but who knows? <laughs> So you're coming up with ideas. So how long is this running list? Is it so with your series, you had something and it lasted only a certain amount of time. You weren't really mm -hmm. right because you were doing stuff outside. So you weren't doing stuff maybe in the super cold or the super heat. Oh, yeah, we were. We for sure were. Oh, gosh, we for sure were. But I, I very much did not really capture as much as much time and effort and expense went into producing those from start to finish, I, I really lost out on the amount of what we call micro content that could have been gleaned from any, I mean, like I could have done 25 videos on every job site that we went to probably and just didn't do it. And so, I mean, we're talking about 30 seconds to a minute. I can go on for five minutes about almost anything. So, I mean, I could talk to a wall about the texture of a brick or whatever. And so, um, I, I, back to your original question, which was, do I worry about repeating myself? No, I don't because the algorithms being what they are, a lot of people aren't going to see everything I post anyway. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if they can see a 10th of what I'm posting, they probably will still never see the same thing twice. You know, I, I love that piece of advice because I think sometimes we worry about 
it's the same thing. I think every client is different. Every, every job is different. So there's going to be some nuances, but maybe we need to be thinking about what micro content could we produce today? And maybe we have a goal of setting, like producing two pieces of micro content a week. Um, and then we get to doing something on a more regular basis where we're mm -hmm. maybe doing a chunk in a day or a chunk and then we split it out. But one of the first hires was Nate or your first hire, right? Your first full time. Yeah, my very first hire. It and is also, scary. <laughs> it is. It's it, very scary. And that's yeah. a huge way to scale, right? You're growing in this way. Um, I just believe in it so much is really the thing. I believe in video content and I believe that it is, it is the thing. I'm always on my phone. Everybody I see is always on their phone. They're looking at Facebook. They're looking at Instagram. You know, I just believe in it. And let me um, go back just a second to the people worrying about seeing it twice. I think that also adds to the authenticity. When people hear you say the same thing over and over again, because it's part of who you are. I mean, I can tell you, if I asked Instagram right now, the followers there, the audience there, they would tell you that shutters that don't work drive me nuts. They could tell you a litany of things. They could tell you things that we could put on t-shirts. And that's what's awesome about an engaged audience. They know you so well that when you put, the other day I posted a picture of a front porch and I said, what do you guys, it was from HGTV actually. I think walmart.com was a sponsor. And I said, what, what do you guys think I would say is wrong with this? I got 50 messages saying those lights are way too small for the front porch. They know, I didn't have to tell them. I've said it so many times and I've preached so long about lights being too too small on people's exterior spaces that they get it now. And so that like, to me, that's the best feeling that they now know. Again, I've taught them something they didn't have to hire me to come over and tell them that they needed a bigger light. They know if they see a light in Lowe's or Home Depot that they're about to buy for their front porch, it's too small. Catherine, like they have my, my, my uh, voice in their head, which is like the most amazing thing. Yes, because you have an awesome voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's the voice. But you know, maybe not my I voice, know. but my no, idea. Your, well, and it's, <laughs> you're teaching them. So it's like yeah. taking in what could, uh, have you ever, maybe y'all have listened to this podcast, it's 99% invisible. And it's really about how design is just in the regular everyday life. And so that's kind of what you're doing. You're taking the regular and teaching, you're elevating what they know and why, t telling them why those lights are too small. But it's something that they could actually make a difference. And a lot of it for you is, it could be people who are going to hire you, but it shows them that you know what you're doing. It also shows them that you are, um, you're consistent. You're always doing the same thing. Yeah. Or if you're learning something new, you're going to tell them about this new thing that you've learned. Right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm practical. And ultimately I know we've talked about this. What is my why? My why is that I want people to love where they live. And I don't think that there should be a cost barrier on that. I don't think that I should be the cost barrier for that or living in a rich neighborhood should be the cost barrier on that. I truly believe that you should drive into your driveway or your dirt road or whatever it is that you live on after you've gone to work all day and you don't want to immediately run out to a bar or go hang out with somebody else. All you want to do is stay at home because you love it so much. And maybe it all came from thrift stores and maybe it all came from trash piles. I don't care. But if you love it, that's what makes me happy because I think that everybody should love where they live. All right. So what about this? How is, is it important for people to share everything and how do you balance this? So doc says, um, that a lot of things have been really helpful. He said the idea to document and not create is helpful because he says he doesn't feel like he has an interesting life. Can you speak to that? Because I think some of the things that you don't think are interesting have been really interesting to some of your. Okay. Here's a perfect example. Doug. Is it doc or Doug? D doc. D-O-C. Doc. I started. Okay. I hate cooking. Hey, like when I tell you I hate cooking, I can't even explain how much I hate cooking, but I have four kids. And my husband's a school teacher, so I got to cook. You know, somebody's got to cook around here and feed people because they always want to eat. People always want to eat for like at least three times a day. So anyway, for what I, I'm documenting, I'm not creating. So I started documenting me cooking um, for the family and talking about how much I hate it. I freaking hate it. Hate it. Like this, this face is all the time on the cooking. People love watching me cook. 
because a lot of them are stay-at-home moms or moms that are working that come home and don't know what to cook. And if I hate cooking as much as I do and I can still come up with an idea, then they can do it too. I think generally people like watching people cook too. Anyway, I think that's boring. I don't want to watch anybody cook, but the engagement is so good that now it is keeping me cooking. Mm. <laughs> we're not eating out as much anymore. I'm saving money because the engagement. And so they were helping me out just by engaging in something that I thought was really boring. I really did think cooking on camera was boring. But so, but as it. a, as a designer, oh. <laughs> how, well, how, how do you, how do you bring in your regular life? You've said, I try not to put the kids on, right? It's not that I try not to. I, I just, I don't know if it's partly because a I don't think people care, but I don't think it's my prerogative to put my like I'll some I used to pull out the phone and they'd be like, "Mama, don't film me," and I would say, "Okay," and I'd put away the phone, you know, because um, they'd be doing something cute or whatever. But I, um, I, I don't, I don't know that I've made some sort of conscious decision not to keep them in there. Um, I just felt like I'm doing my thing, and why, why include them if they don't really, you know, need to be? I guess. Okay, so then um, how do, have you gotten to know your audience? Because I know we're right at the end of our time. How have I gotten to know my audience? Do you ask them questions? Like when you're, you know, how do you know that they like, how do you know that they like to see you cooking? Because they message me and say so. I mean, they, people will DM you things that they won't comment on your posts. It's really interesting. The things that they'll privately DM you about, um, are very different. And a lot of times I'll use those as content. I'll uh, scratch out their screen name and screenshot those and put them up as content. And that encourages other people to start DMing you. When they see that you're responding to DMs, and let's talk about that too. You've got, if you want social media, media engagement, you have to engage with them. Every comment, every DM, I respond to every single one. And I don't with say- With an emoji? Uh -huh. No. No, Diane, not with an emoji. We don't respond with emojis. If someone says, oh my gosh, I love those shutters, maybe I'll say, thank you so much. It took me so, I, I labored, I belay, you know, labored over the color, color I was going to choose. I chose from 15 different colors. Like I really put a response in there because the amount of people who, who like a post is a small percent. The people who comment on a post is even smaller. And the fact that they took time out of their day to do that deserves more than a, like an emoji that's already that they've already attached at the top of the comment line where you can just hit one like like the least amount of effort ever given you know <laughs> so one of the things i love and this was a great tip that you gave me you said i treat it like i'm responding to a friend like somebody i already know Absolutely. and i am and so that's a different way of looking at it that's again a philosophy These people don't owe you anything they do not owe you a follow they do not owe you a comment the fact that they're taking time like i said out of their day to comment or say anything to you is is huge so i mean i know how busy i am i can't imagine how busy other people are and so that moment that they take to read or watch or whatever and then to say something about it they could just have kept they could have watched it and kept scrolling and so um i feel like i deserve they deserve from me the same amount of attention you know from me that they gave to me do you start conversations that way? Is it like a DM back and forth sometimes? Do yeah. you ask them? Okay, so because that's where a friend, that's what a friend is doing, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so so I don't I don't end it. I until you know how conversations usually end where like someone's done with the conversation, so end it with like a heart or a thumbs up or whatever, and you kind of know it's over with. That's I mean, I wait until it's done, you know. Do I, you ever give the heart or the thumbs up? <gasps> is thumbs up not the most offensive emoji that there is? It's just like, okay, whatever you think. You know what I mean? It's, it's okay. That's how I feel about thumbs up. <laughs> if I type all this stuff and they just give me the thumbs up, I'm always like. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But, but yes, I do give hearts a lot. I give a lot of hearts. Okay. All right, so that's a good tip too. Man, um, okay, so I feel like we haven't even covered half of these because we have Sorry. Haven't. No, it's so, I think you've given us some good tips, I think, right, guys? Um, all right, so what about in two minutes, tell us how someone can build authority. We've talked about being authentic. Is there a difference in building authority? Because that's about you as a, landscape designer i don't know sure what you mean by authority 
So as people come to you to ask you for this, because they know, you know, Mm -hmm. so it's different than just being, um, it's kind of like you're being an expert in this. So is there a difference in, in that of building recognition or, um, I mean, because to me, I think of uh, it's a little different between being an authority on a subject, and so I think it has to do with consistency. You've kind of already said are that. You, like, are you basically using the word expert? I mean, is that the, yeah? It's kind of like expert. Uh, yes, I hate that word. I know that's I just, why I liked authority. <laughs> I don't. You can use a synonym. It's all the same. I don't. I don't like the word expert or guru or whatever. It's just like, uh, but so you're no, consistent. I, <laughs> You're consistent in answering or you, um, you're not worried about having repeat things. You're doing it in a new way, but you're saying, just like you said, uh, with, uh, with the lights, right? But that's, the, that's an expert opinion, but you have, um, you, you can prove it, right? There's, this is better. This is better design. So in a Again, way. Design is subjective. I mean, it's, it really is my opinion. It's my, it's, it is my opinion. Ultimately, it's my opinion. There's probably plenty of people who disagree with me, and that's okay. But there are plenty of people who um, are following along, believing, you know, believing what I say, and, and will do it for themselves. And, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's not a good way to end this podcast. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. So I just want you guys to, I hope you guys go watch it. And did you know that, so Catherine taught me this, she, she's taught me a lot of things, but this is one of the things that if you had something like, like a web series, you decided to put it up and it's on YouTube, you can actually submit it to Amazon prime. It's a that's little right. bit of a headache, I think. Right. A little bit. It has to be transcribed. It has to be, you have to have a file. They watch it before they'll put it up. It's pretty rigorous, but yeah, it's worth it. It's great. But if you want to learn something and you want to laugh while you're learning about seeing how she's um, taken over somebody's and re transforming somebody's backyard or back deck or uh, the front porch or the side yard or your, I just think it's, People watch this all the time on HGTV, and I don't have cable. So Catherine's <laughs> my HGTV. I think it's so great. One of my alumni um, fangirled you, Amanda, was like, oh, my God. Yes, I love Amanda. Right? Yes. I love her, too. And what I loved was Catherine knew her by her screen name, right? Yeah. Amanda she, Wawa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. and I think that that's really important. So engagement, engage, 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 be real. How do you, how do you have time? You have four kids, you're running a business, you are a wife. How do you have time? And cause these kids are like, what, 10? No, eight. Yeah. 11 down to five. Yeah. Okay. So they're all in school. I have all day. I got all day. I got nothing but time, Diane. No, but how do you balance? Um, doing all the things of a mom and doing running a business and doing the video because sometimes being on social media, man, my husband wants me to shut this thing down. He's like, Diane, it's family time. And I'm like, okay, family time. Just one more. Like, let me, you know, right. And I'm really, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just not on it that much. Like it's, it's difficult for me. So I think the, the, one of the answers is I'm not on it as much as probably people think I am. People think you're so busy. They see my Instagram and they think you're so busy, but it's literally, if you count up all those 15 seconds of time, it took me 10 minutes maybe to film all the stuff that I'm filming, you know? So it really doesn't take that much time in total. It just seems like it does. Cause again, I don't edit. I just post it. Um, the second thing is, really and truly uh, the answer that I've had for all this time is that my husband is a great supporter of what I'm doing. And I can't imagine having to do all of this without someone who is, is in my corner, you know, take the kids if I need ex- to get extra time to work, you know, whatever it is, um, moving schedules around, we just work really well together. And so, um, luckily I have a job that I can work when they go to bed or, you know, different times. He's a football coach. And so he's gone for long periods of time. So I work while he's away when the kids are in bed. So it's just been nice to have a job where you can do little bits and pieces all over the place and have a supportive spouse partner. Yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> I want to make sure that everybody can follow you. Watch these series. They're like, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes. Like, Yeah, they're like 9 to 11, 12 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Because people's attention spans are short. 
<laughs> but it's really good. You cover a lot in that amount of time. It's really, it's really, and it's very well produced. That's something that before she hired Nate, she always, she had somebody professional that was doing this so that she does know how to do it. We'll have to ask that on a part two because it was <laughs> just too good. All right. So I want to make sure that everybody knows that all these links will be down below, but you can, uh, I'm going to spell your last name. Hopefully everybody can spell Catherine. It's with a C. Catherine A. It sounds like a, a, it's Aaronsburg. I know how to say it, but that's not how it looks like. It's A R E N S B E R G dot com. And then on Instagram, it's that same thing, Catherine with a C, Aaronsburg. And then on YouTube, it's a crazy thing because you have, I don't know, whatever. But it's if you look on YouTube, Simple Honest Design, or if you look up Catherine Aaronsburg, if you spell her name right, it'll pop up. It will. All right. So Catherine, thank you so much. For, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. And thank you all that commented. I'm glad that you guys were all here. It's good to see all these awesome comments and support for Diane. <laughs> well, you got <laughs> people from Canada. Dave's here. I know. And Chicago. We got people from all, Hawaii. Yep. yep. <gasps> That's my husband's home state. Hawaii is born in Maui. Oh, cool. Well, Mario's here. It's like six hours. I never know. I always. I think it's we'll, eight. Yeah, it's, it might be six. All right, it's early and it's, it's late, really early there. It's yeah. late for Fred in Belgium. Belgium, anyway. That all is right. so cool. Just so you guys know, next week is all about remote workers. So instead of like bringing the people who are hiring the remote workers, I have the remote workers on with me. There will be five of us on next week. So there will be lots of them. So really, again, a lot of design recharges for people who are entrepreneurs. We're people who are scaling our business. And as we're scaling, we have to have some sort of ways to do that. So how do you turn things over? How do you, how does that work? And then some of the fears that I've had as an entrepreneur, how do I know that they're doing it? They say they're working 40 hours. Are they really doing 40 hours? I'm paying them. You know, it's all these kind of anxiety things. But for us to grow, same thing with you, Catherine, for us to grow, we have to actually, um, we have to, there's, we can't produce more hours in the day. There's only so fast we can get. So we actually have to expand or, um, uh, be able to ha have somebody else producing something, doing Nate, some of the other jobs. <laughs> Nate works remote now, by the way. Hey, awesome. Did I tell you that? You told me that he was, y'all were thinking about it because it sort of stressed you out having him over He's your in shoulder. my house. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so next week we have some people who work overseas. They work in, Allie works in, um, she's here in Mobile, but she works in London. Sam is in Michigan, Michigan, Minnesota one of those cold M states that's not Maine and in the middle of the country. And then she work he works for somebody in Portland and then um, Suzanne works for somebody in Portland. I got a, a lot of Portland people. And then uh, Louise works for a company who they're all over, but the, her first week at her work, she went to Spain, but she, um, she was living in Denver when she, uh, First started working with them anyway so it'll be about remote and some of the questions that maybe you want to ask you're afraid to hire and we're gonna ask the real questions the tough questions are coming next week so we'll see you guys then and and then I'm I think I have the week off because I'm gonna be in Bend Oregon so if you want to go to an awesome design conference it's about 400 people and it's an intimate and it's gonna be so much fun and I can't wait. I hope you guys will join me. If you go to Ben Design, maybe Ben Design Conference, it'll be in the link below. But check it out. Uh, I'll be doing a workshop and I'll be on a panel about positivity. I don't know why, because I'm so negative. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> anyway, we'll see you guys next week. And thank you guys for tuning in and always being here. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks guys for listening and thank you, Catherine, for another great episode. I really appreciate you coming on and being so authentic and honest with us. Hopefully maybe we'll take some of these tips and put them into practice and maybe we'll start, maybe we, me and the mouse in my pocket, we'll start making some micro content of my own. I actually think that's a good challenge. Maybe that's a new design challenge. And did you know that we do design challenges on a regular basis with Design Recharge? You do them through 
being a patron. And that's another way to support the channel. You will get the part two, which hopefully Catherine will record with me to get the rest of the story, right? And that's another way to support the channel and the podcast and get extra content like this part two or doing design challenges. So you can get that at patreon.com slash Diane Gibbs. And I wanted to tell you about my favorite way to build websites is with the Elementor plugin that works with almost any WordPress theme, making almost any theme invincible. This plugin has changed the way I have been able to create and design websites. It's also increased my speed with doing it. Um, it also is very easy for the user to use if they're updating or where they want to change content or add content. So it's super user friendly as well. This plugin where other visual builders have fallen short, Elementor uses common sense and it was really easy for me to understand and implement. I'm loving it and I hope you do too. It is a total game changer. You can use this affiliate link to purchase the plan that's right for you. And if you go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash capital D, capital R, Elementor. And then you can buy your plan. There's also a free one to try. And then when you're ready, your price doesn't change by using this affiliate link. It's just that I get a little piece of the pie. Another way you can support the show is by using this link on Timely. Timely is the way I track my time now. I love this app. You can get it on your phone or you can get it on your computer. I have it on my computer. It's the way I use it the most, but I do have it on my phone as well. And it helps me because I often forget as I'm running a business, I'm teaching, I'm doing the podcast. There's so many things that I, I miss. And one of them is, is, oh my goodness, how long did I work on that? Did I work on that for 30 minutes or was it three hours? I can't remember. But Timely has this memory option, which I call the stalker option because it's watching what I'm doing. Well, I'm not doing anything bad, so it's, they can stalk me because I, and I love this because it's telling me maybe where I'm wasting time even. I can go back and see who I was emailing, what I was doing. Um, so it it helps me a lot be able to really track uh, projects better. And then I can bid them out better next time if I've gone over on something. So when you sign up for Timely via this link, you'll be able to receive 10% discount once you activate your subscription. Again, you're able to try Timely for 14 days before activating your subscription just to make sure that Timely is the right fit for you, which I love that. It was for me, and you can get the link at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash D-R Timely, like Dr. Timely. Anyway, that's it. Next week, we have four guests plus me. So there'll be five of us on the screen, and we're talking about remote workers. Do you want to work remotely? Or maybe you're ready to hire somebody but you don't have 40 hours to give or 20 hours to give, maybe you just have 10 or five, then maybe you need a remote worker. These people are working remote. How do you make sure they're checking their time? How to, you know, doing what you need. So all these, they're gonna, we're gonna ask some questions that hopefully will help you. If you wanna either work remotely, you know what it's all about, or if you're ready to scale and you wanna hire somebody remote, maybe this takes some of the guessing game out. So we'll see you next week and have a great whatever afternoon, morning, midnight. I don't know. Whenever you're watching or listening. Anyway, have a great whatever. Interesting to you. Maybe I'll cut that out. That was a great episode with you, Catherine. Mm -hmm. And a 30 day treat. Hey guys, for the little.